Michael Sineski is an entrepreneur who has founded businesses in a cross-section of sectors. Why don't we talk about your ventures and your life in Puerto Rico? Let's start from where did you move from, when, and why? So uh, my name is Michael Sinensky and um, I've been coming to uh, Puerto Rico since I was around four or five years old. For I'm 44 now, so the last 40 years. Um, and um, I love it here. I've uh, vacationed, done business here. And um, I recently moved with my family, actually, uh, in December of uh, this past year. Um, wife and three kids, and uh, okay. we're out in Dorado, so we're super happy. Okay, and let's talk about your ventures in Puerto Rico in terms of your businesses. Why don't we start with, you know, your company, company name, and what it is that you're doing on the island. Um, so, uh, my company name is, um, so I have two major industries that I'm in. Um, first industry that I actually moved to Puerto Rico for was my medical supplies and um, supply chain logistics company, um, Supply Chain Solutions, and um, that's called WeShield. Uh, but my passion, my overall passion in life is the uh, hospitality, food and beverage industry, and um, that's where we're sitting right now, Sushi by Boo. So let's talk about Sushi by Boo. When did you open? And I know that you worked with partners, right? So why don't we talk a little bit about this, this operation? Um, so Sushi Babu in Puerto Rico opened up uh, in March of this year and um, I uh, opened up with a longtime friend and uh, business associate uh, Shimmy McGew who also owns uh, Brava for close to I think 30 years Yes. Um, and uh, another partner Paco Lopez um, who is uh, one of the largest concert promoters on the island um, and just uh, we have a, an amazing both business and friendship uh, partnership that uh, looking to grow from here to do a lot of other things in Puerto Rico. It's been open for around three months now. Around three months, okay. um, And it's been incredible. Uh, I don't want to jinx it, but we have a perfect five-star rating on Google, which okay. is unheard of. Um, so you could say it's the highest rated sushi bar in all of Puerto Rico. And um, the product and the quality and the service is all amazing. And before you launched here, because this is a, a sort of a different concept in terms of size and I'm thinking ambiance, what kind of um, market research did you do? Because there are sushi places all over the place. So now um, in, this, in this passion industry that I'm in, um, you know, I, I don't really think that I'm opening up restaurants. I think I'm opening up um, experiential dining. Uh, you know, so like I consider this more like a Broadway show, not a restaurant. Okay. So you know, you, you pre-reserve uh, a seat, you get a certain time that you have to be here on time, and then we have, you know, it's around almost the same customer to staff ratio, so you're getting uh, an unbelievable service, um, you know, almost one-to-one, -one, uh, where you have a chef uh, serving you piece by piece, you know, um, the old-fashioned way, like you're eating in Tokyo. You know, hand-to-hand, uh, -hand where we don't we tell you not to use chopsticks. So this is not a traditional, you know, sushi restaurant where you can get rolls and like things like that. This is, you know, what's what's called omakase. Mm -hmm. So it's trust the chef. You're getting a set menu where the chef is serving you piece by piece. So it's it's definitely um, you know nothing like a, a regular sushi restaurant. Do you think um, there's an opportunity to open more restaurants, if not this one, than other concepts? Um, so my company, Simple Venue, um, has numerous concepts. Um, we actually take underutilized space and we turn it into unique foodie concepts. So this is a perfect example of underutilized, which was closed for around five years uh, since Maria. Um, and um, I, I chose this hotel because of how iconic it is. Uh, I've been coming here for vacation um, business for so many years and, and this is the hotel to be in, in Puerto Rico. And I wanted to make sure that we, you know, our first one here, especially with me living here now, we did it the right way in the best hotel possible. Um, as far as other hotels, other places, we definitely expect to open up more Sushi by Booze together with, uh, with the team. Um, we're already looking into other areas such as Palmas, uh, Rio Grande, um, Condado. Will they also be this sort of condensed space concept? So it all, this it isn't all, very big. Right, so, so um, the normal space for us is a micro concept because that is usually what is considered underutilized in a hotel. It's finding a closet, finding um, even a hotel room itself. Um, a, a luggage storage room, you know, anything and everything, which usually tends to be 
you know, uh, empty space, small micro yeah. space. Mm -hmm. uh, the larger spaces, you know, they hotels try to do traditional lease deals for, but with these kind of spaces, I, I get to have a little more leeway and partner with the hotel versus a, a traditional lease. With Puerto Rico, there's definitely, um, you know, uh, I think a need to elevate the uh, the foodie world. I think this is a great start. Um, there's so many other things that uh, I'm looking to do here. Like uh, as an example. Um, my kids started an event planning company here because I, I want to instill an entrepreneurial spirit in them too and teach them how to run a business. So they started an event planning company. Yesterday we actually did um, uh, a fun pizza party in Dorado where um, I flew uh, a couple of friends from New York, very well-known pizza makers and um, a wine sommelier. And we did uh, an amazing uh, Nepal, uh, Naples style pizza party where we had a wood fire pizza oven on a farm and um, you know the people who came there said this is the best pizza they've ever had in Puerto Rico. So I, these are the things that I'd love to do on this island and just um, try to help you know elevate something that's amazing already but make it a little better. Have you thought of other cuisines? You just mentioned Italian, you just mentioned Thai. So uh, um, as far as other uh, different brands and, and types of uh, cuisines that we do um, I, you know, since we do take underutilized space, it, it's more experiential. Um, so, having said that, we're going to do things like, um, you know, we have a concept called the Wagyu Room, um, which is, you know, a Wagyu tasting. We have a, a, a mixology omakase, so we'll, we'll find, you know, a few amazing mixologists on the island and and do like a, an amazing tasting of different uh, specialty cocktails. Um, we have a concept called omakase which is our vegan uh, sushi concept, which I would love to do here. Uh, there's a big need for uh, healthier, plant-based, you know, sustainable options here. Um, so, so yeah, so we're definitely gonna hit some other cuisines, um, and I would love to partner with some other chefs uh, to do some, some, you know, a Korean barbecue restaurant, as an example. Um, you know, even a ghost kitchen that offers, you know, five different cuisines in a much smaller format. Um, that you know, just just different cool opportunities that uh, we're looking at. In your time here, you know, have you been able to assess the challenges of the food industry in Puerto Rico? So uh, there are definitely major challenges. Um, you know, in in any place you try to open up a business, uh, with us being on an island, uh, the importing of of high quality goods um, that have to go through a lot of red tape with the states are, is a, definitely a problem. Um, there is a, a lack of, uh, you know, talent pool. As an example, as I said before, a lot of people have left the island um, since Maria, and then especially COVID. So, getting people back here, um, you know, getting the uh, the right staff to, to work at these locations that we're expecting. Um, so, as I said before, with more opportunity, there's definitely more people will be available um, and stay on the island and not leave. So, um, you know, that's definitely one of the challenges of this building, this rebuilding time that we're seeing. Um, and, you know, just um, allowing people the time it takes to uh, open up to ideas like this in, in a market that they're not used to something like this, you know, being on time. <laughs> you know, it's island time. Um, so so we, we are selling, we're selling time, you know, we're selling, it's like you're buying a piece of real estate uh, for a certain amount of time at our experiences, so you have to be here on time. It starts with or without you. Sure. Now, what about your contributions to nonprofits as part of an Act 20 beneficiary? Who are you working with? Philanthropy is a huge part of my life. Um, you know, um, uh, in my religion, we believe to give away at least 10% of our income, and, and I follow that. Um, I have numerous charities myself that uh, benefit um, certain things I'm, I'm truly passionate about, whether it was, uh, you know, um, disaster relief because my hometown of Rockaway, Queens was destroyed after Hurricane Sandy, so I understand um, what happened here with Maria. So, so certain, um, you know, natural disasters, uh, I, we are looking to definitely help to make people more resilient and, and help them prepare for that. Um, in addition, helping, um, you know, with uh, things that are near and dear to, to my heart, which uh, I'm half Israeli and half Ukrainian. So uh, the last couple of years have been a little rough with, um, you know, the wars imposed on, on my family in, in both areas. So we have charities to, to help uh, protect 
you know, people, volunteers, civilians there. But as far as here in the island, um, you know, the environment is a huge thing for us, cleaning up the waters. Uh, we're looking into helping um, certain charities that help stray animals. There's a lot, just from being here around six months now, I see there's so many stray dogs and cats, and I see there's a lot of good charities that, uh, that we're looking to uh, help out with that as well. Um, are you involved in the Act 2022 Society? Do you interact, you know, if any, with other Act 20 beneficiaries? So, what do you uh, talk about? So um, we, uh, being here on the ACT program, um, we live in an area in Dorado where there are definitely a lot of other um, same applicants like me. Um, and uh, when, we, when we meet and hang out, we talk about opportunities that we see. Um, you know, it's just, it's a lot of people with the right mindset that, you know, think about moving your family to, to Puerto Rico from wherever you came from, whether it's Texas or New York or, or California. So that mindset of picking up your family to come here for an opportunity based on incentives, it's, it's a similar type of person that is looking for you know, new opportunities, new ways to uh, create. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, ideas and, and, and spitballing uh, just fun ideas that we can do together on the island. And there's a few crazy things that we're, that we're looking to do, like uh, I'm looking to buy an RV <laughs> and put a sushi bar in an RV. Um, I'm talking with a couple of buddies that I have in Texas and we're going to um, bring in a, a, a really amazing smoker um, and, and open up a barbecue restaurant, but Texas style, um, you know, like Texas smoked, you know, so imagine briskets and, and pork butt and full chickens and, you know, so, so uh, this is what we talk about. Okay. So do you think as a group, you know, you're all doing enough for Puerto Rico? It's, I mean, it's never enough. There's never enough uh, time in a day. Um, you know, as as an entrepreneur, we always think we could do better, and we're uh, we're perfectionists. And um, there's more we could always do, of course. Um, you know, one of the major problems that we're we would love to work on, and we always talk about as well, is helping the government uh, reduce red tape um, to make things easier for opportunities to be created. And um, you know, it's definitely. Uh, in, in every government, there's always obviously a lot of extra red tape that you have to uh, try to navigate through and make easier. So that's something that um, I think that uh, we we would love to help with, make better. And and I think the program got me here. So obviously, uh, you know, it, it's a good program um, because it gets. Uh, I, I've hired over a thousand people in my career. Um, so with that mindset, now I'm here. And I, you know, I know I'm going to be hiring hundreds of people here. Um, you know, in in industries where people make, you know, around 25 plus an hour. So you know, it depends what you think is a good job or not, and what you think is uh, is is good for society or not. But do I think that it's helpful? Yes. So why don't we talk about your other line of business, uh, We Shield? Under that, you created Brain Chain, right? Which is, uh, is a division empowered by AI. Can we talk a little bit about how you're applying artificial intelligence into your operation and, and what good comes out of it? So um, we shield this company that I started um, right after COVID happened. I actually owned around 25 restaurants. Uh, and I remember March 17, 2020. It's like uh, the day that will live in infamy for me and my family. Every single one of my places closed like that, like a light switch off. And um, it was the first time in my life I went on unemployment. It was unbelievably scary. Um, so I uh, quickly tried you know, to, to see where I could fit in, in the need um, for what was happening and um, use my network um, and um, my best friend and business partner, uh, Roman, who, who moved here three years ago. Um, we created uh, a medical supply company that that uh, obviously saw a need for you know uh, PP personal protective equipment so gloves um, you know masks all things related to COVID um, we were savvy enough to figure out how to find the supply and then we instilled artificial intelligence marketing um, and this was four years ago uh, to get to every single desk uh, of the people that were looking to buy it, whether it was government, Fortune 500 companies, um, hospitals, etc., and you know we did very well in that business. And that then we saw you know it moved from one thing to the next based on supply chain issues. So 
it wasn't a question of knowing what was the next issue. It was a question of when to know the next issue was happening. So it, we were always two, three months late, you know, figuring it out. So we have been developing artificial intelligence software to identify, you know, the next trends of supply chain shortages. And um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, with with this um, software they were created, it picked up as an example Ozempic. Um, so you know, now we're investing in in uh, semaglutide, um, you know, manufacturing. So it, this is something that um, you know it. it can save industries, as an example, if you could figure out that there's going to be a shortage of tomatoes or, or eggs or something like that, and you can help you know, farms prepare for that, and, and you can invest in them to, to prepare for that. Imagine how many companies and industries and people you can save on shortages by seeing it early enough. Are you working with companies in Puerto Rico at all? Um, so with WeShield and BrainChain, yes, we're working uh, with the government here. Um, you know, uh, we were helping them uh, supply uh, certain tests like flu and COVID tests for a little while to um, Medicare and Medicaid patients. Um, you know, we provide tablets uh, to people in need, um, and we, we identify uh, you know certain people with the government that uh, you know uh, are looking for educational tablets that they don't have. Um, there's, there's a lot of other things too that, uh, you know, that obviously uh, there's a lot of shortages in this world right now. Um, so it's identifying things quickly enough and then working with the companies to, to build them up quickly enough to then be able to, to service, uh, you know, demand. So um, WeShield has uh, offices in the United States and then we um, ownership and, and are all out here. Um, and we have warehousing here now, um, you know, so we have um, marketing uh, people here now, we have uh, offices here now, um, but again, the majority are in the states, and then the ACT program got us to move here, and then what is that doing? It's creating new opportunities. As I said, we opened up a warehouse here, offices, marketing divisions, etc. One final thought, well, how is life on the island for you? And what do you see happening, maybe perhaps in three to five years for you? So, so I've been a permanent resident here for around six months, and um, I, my biggest regret is not moving here much sooner. Um, I spent so much time grinding, like, you know, uh, the day-to-day -day hustle in Manhattan. Like, that, that rat race is tough. Like, you know, it's uh, every single day, 20 hours a day. But here, it's like, you know, I don't find I'm working less, but now I'm doing it in, in a beautiful environment with amazing people, with such an amazing culture, um, and I'm just looking to be, uh, uh, you know, a help to this island and, and not a burden. You speak Spanish? Un poquito. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Gracias. and um, I'm sure we'll speak again. Thank you so much.